The BC Coast is also home to one of the most iconic, recognizable, and lovable aquatic mammals, the sea otter. Sea otters have actually endured a long, dark history in North America. It started as nothing more than a desperate idea. The waters off the Pacific coast of Canada had become eerily lifeless, where once there had been vibrant kelp forests swaying beneath the surface, teeming with fish, crabs, and sea lions there. Were now ghostly underwater deserts, barren stretches covered in sea urchins and rock. Fishermen pulled up empty nets. Divers who once explored colorful marine worlds now found only silence. Marine biologists feared the worst. The ecosystem was unraveling. At the heart of this collapse was a chain reaction triggered by the absence of a single animal, the sea otter. Once common along the coast, sea otters had been hunted nearly to extinction by fur traders. With their disappearance, a quiet but devastating transformation began. Without sea otters to keep them in check, sea urchins exploded in number. Consuming entire kelp forests from the roots up, these forests essential not just for marine life, but for shoreline protection and carbon absorption, were vanishing at an alarming rate. For decades, the ocean endured this silent devastation until a bold and probable plan began to form. What if, instead of trying to fix the damage directly, scientists brought back the missing predator? Could the return of the sea otter reverse? Decades of destruction and breathe life back into the ocean. By the late 1960s, this idea had become the foundation of a daring conservation strategy. A group of Canadian scientists and environmental officials launched what would become one of the most radical ecological experiments in the country's history. The goal wasn't just to reintroduce sea otters for the sake of the species. It was to use the otter as a tool, a natural engineer to restore balance in the marine ecosystem. This concept, known as predator-led restoration, was revolutionary at the time relied on a phenomenon called a trophic cascade, where the reintroduction of a top predator causes a domino effect that reshapes the entire food web. If sea otters returned, they would eat the overpopulated sea urchins. With fewer urchins, kelp could grow back. And with kelp forests restored, fish, shellfish, birds, and mammals could thrive again. The stakes were enormous, but so was the resistance. Coastal communities, particularly those that relied on shellfish harvesting like sea urchins, crabs, and clams, feared the return of sea otters. These creatures eat up to 25% of their body weight in shellfish every day. For many families, especially indigenous groups and small-scale fishermen, the otter wasn't a hero. It was a threat to their livelihoods. The government tried to assure them that the long-term ecological gains would outweigh the short-term losses. But tensions ran high. In some areas, people actively protested the plan. Still, despite the criticism and controversy, the plan moved forward. Between 1969 and 1972, nearly 90 sea otters were carefully relocated from Alaska and released along the coast of British Columbia. This was the beginning of something few could fully predict. Reintroducing sea otters was far more complex than simply setting them loose these were highly sensitive animals, prone to stress and disorientation. The process involved intricate planning, transporting them by ship and military aircraft, building specially designed holding tanks, monitoring them closely for signs of illness or distress. Not all the otters survived the journey. Some grew sick during transport. Others, once released, fled the area entirely or returned to shore. The early results were disheartening. Only a fraction of the otters remained in the release zones, and their impact seemed minimal at first. Sea urchin beds still stretched across the seafloor. Shellfish harvesters continued to voice frustration as the otters, in the few places they remained, began to compete with human fishers. Some divers reported sudden declines in local clam and mussel populations. The unpredictability of the otters' behavior made it difficult to track their movements. Some swam far from their release, Zones, settling in unexpected places, others vanished entirely. Critics of the project were quick to declare failure. To them, this was proof that conservation by rewilding was a pipe dream, an expensive gamble that ignored the real-world needs of people who lived along the coast. But quietly, subtle signs began to emerge. In certain pockets were otters, 
had taken hold, scientists started noticing something remarkable. The once dense carpets of sea urchins were thinning. In some coves, the rocky seafloor was no longer purple and spiny, but showing signs of kelp regrowth. The change was slow, nearly imperceptible, but it was there. It wasn't yet a comeback story, but it was a crack in the darkness. Over the next decade, these cracks widened. By the early 1980s, the otter population, though still modest, had begun to stabilize in certain areas. In those places, a quiet transformation was underway. Sea urchin numbers continued to fall. Where the otters hunted consistently, the urchins either died off or retreated into crevices, no longer blanketing the ocean floor. And where urchins disappeared, kelp forests returned. The growth was astonishing. Kelp, one of the fastest growing plants in the world, can shoot up several feet in just a few days when conditions are right. Within years, entire underwater forests were reborn. These kelp beds weren't just beautiful, they were vital. Juvenile fish began to reappear, hiding in the kelp's long fronds. Apps. Sea stars and invertebrates crept back into the ecosystem. Birds that relied on fish returned to the skies. Sea lions followed the fish, and soon the one silent waters were alive again. Divers began reporting scenes of breathtaking change, from lifeless seascapes to lush underwater jungles, teeming with movement and color. This wasn't just a recovery, it was a resurrection. What made it even more incredible was that it had occurred naturally, driven by one animal's return, the sea otter. By simply doing what it had always done, eating had reversed one of the most severe ecological collapses in Canadian waters. House. The success was so dramatic that scientists around the world began pointing to British Columbia as proof that predator-led restoration could work. Not only had kelp forests come back, but with them came improved water quality, reduced coastal erosion, and a resurgence of native marine species. It was, in many ways, a miracle born of biology. But the story didn't stop there. Asked. Asked sea otters. Expanded their territory beyond the original release zones, the effects followed. More urchin barrens were transformed into kelp havens. Each new area where otters took hold became a new center of regrowth. And as these forests spread, the broader ecological benefits became undeniable. Kelp forests don't just support fish. And shellfish, they anchor the seafloor, trap sediments, and reduce the impact of strong waves and storms. In a time of increasing climate threats, kelp offered a buffer against coastal erosion and a tool for carbon capture. In essence, the return of sea otters had helped build a living shield for the coastline. Moreover, scientists began to understand how these systems could serve as models for other parts of the world facing ecological collapse. The Canadian experiment had turned into an international blueprint, yet the story remains complex. Shellfish. Industries continue to wrestle with the otter's impact. But in some areas. Local harvesters and indigenous communities have called for regulated management to balance human needs with ecological gains. Some First Nations have begun developing their own conservation programs that honor. Traditional knowledge while working with modern science to protect both culture and environment. The story of the sea otter, then, is not just one of environmental. Recovery, it's a story of negotiation, adaptation, and resilience. It's about understanding that no solution is perfect, but some can offer a path forward. A single predator once nearly hunted to extinction helped bring balance back to an entire coast. The ocean didn't need saving through machines or chemicals. It needed the return of an ancient rhythm, a creature that had always belonged there. And once it came back, nature did the rest. Beneath the growing canopy of kelp, a quiet transformation was taking place, one that would soon become impossible to ignore. Fish populations expanded rapidly in both number and diversity. Rockfish, greenlings, herring, and juvenile salmon, once driven out by the barren underwater landscape, returned in large schools. These young fish found safe refuge among the dense kelp blades, using the forest like a nursery, a shield from predators and ocean currents. Their return brought others. Larger predators, including harbor seals and sea lions, began to frequent. The area following the scent of renewed abundance.
is even shellfish species, not typically targeted by sea otters, like certain scallops and smaller crab varieties, began. To reappear in the newly rebalanced ecosystem? And it wasn't just the familiar creatures that came back. Dozens of delicate invertebrates, long absent from the region, returned in surprising numbers. Brittle stars clinging to rocks, sea anemones gently swaying in the current and vibrant. Nudibranchy slugs so colorful they looked painted by hand crawling across the reef. The entire coast seemed to awaken. Above water, seabirds returned to feed, diving into the waves to snatch fish from just beneath the surface. The once silent waters now echoed with sound, the rush of surf, the splash of seals, the chatter of birds. The coastline that had long felt empty was now full of movement, full of life, full of color. Even the behavior of marine species began to change. With sea otters re-established as dominant predators, prey species adapted their movements, avoiding overgrazing and maintaining a healthier balance in the food web. And unlike artificial control methods like urchin culling, which often fails, to target the ecosystem as a whole, the presence of sea otters created a self-regulating system. The otters didn't eliminate urchins completely. They kept their populations in check, allowing enough to remain for natural processes to continue, without letting them decimate the kelp once more. This balance, sustained not by constant human effort, but by nature itself, began to repeat wherever the otters settled. As they moved into new territories along the coast, they brought the same transformation with them. Urchin populations dropped, kelp surged back, biodiversity increased, and soon the impact stretched far beyond the original release sites. Healthy marine zones expanded outward like ripples, creating living corridors of restored habitat up and down the west coast. Okay, by the early 2000s, the results were undeniable. The sea otter population in British Columbia had surged from just a few dozen to over 3,000 individuals by 2004. Less than a decade later, that number exceeded 5,600, and in neighboring regions like California and Alaska, similar patterns were emerging. Wherever the otters returned, life followed. These animals weren't just surviving. They were thriving and leading one of the most profound ecological revivals in recent memory. As scientists observed the unfolding transformation, they began to refer to the project as a textbook case of successful rewilding. It was more than just a win for conservation. It was a story of hope, of resilience, and of the astonishing regenerative power of nature when given even the smallest chance to recover. What had once been written off as a dying coastline had come roaring. Back to life? But the restoration wasn't only ecological, it was economic and climatic as well, in ways few had anticipated when the project began. As the kelp forests expanded and marine biodiversity flourished, economists started to take a closer look. At the broader impact of this restoration, what they found was astonishing. In 2020, researchers from the University of British Columbia conducted a detailed study assessing the long-term value of sea otter reintroduction. Their findings revealed that a healthy sea otter population in British Columbia was contributing an estimated $53 million per year in combined benefits. These gains came from three powerful forces. Improved fish productivity expanded carbon storage, and a booming tourism economy. As kelp forests recovered, they created ideal habitats for fish species critical to local economies. Rockfish, herring, and even salmon benefited from the restored ecosystem, growing larger populations and more predictable life cycles. This directly supported more sustainable fishing in nearby regions, providing fishers with reliable catches without the long-term Damage caused by previous over-harvesting and imbalance. But the kelp's contribution didn't stop there. Scientists began to recognize kelp forests as valuable allies in the fight against climate change. Like trees, kelp absorbs carbon dioxide during photosynthesis, but it does it faster. As the kelp grows, it locks away carbon in its tissues. When parts of the plant die, they sink to the ocean floor where that carbon is buried and effectively removed from circulation, though kelp isn't a substitute for large-scale climate policies. Its role in coastal carbon capture turned out to be significant. The sea otters, by allowing the kelp to return, indirectly helped trap tens of thousands of tons of carbon. 
one mouthful of urchins at a time, perhaps the most visible sign of success to local communities, though came not from numbers or graphs, but from the tourists who began showing up in growing waves. Sea otters are irresistibly charismatic. Watching them float on their backs, crack open shellfish with rocks, or groom their impossibly dense. Fur became a natural draw for visitors. Towns along Vancouver Island saw new business from wildlife tours, diving excursions, and eco-lodges offering travelers a front-row seat to nature's revival. Whale-watching companies added otter safaris to their rosters. Families drove for hours just to catch a glimpse of the animals in the wild. For many, seeing an otter in its natural habitat was more than just cutite, was powerful, was cutite was, living proof that restoration was possible. For small businesses that had long struggled after the decline of traditional fisheries, this new stream of ecotourism brought renewed hope and stability. And while some shellfish harvesters did experience, losses particularly those who relied heavily on urchins and mussels, the same UBC study found that these losses, estimated around $7 million per year, were vastly outweighed by the $53 million in ecosystem benefits. What emerged was a stronger, more diversified coastal economy. One rooted not in extraction but in coexistence by 2025 the sea otter. Population in British Columbia had continued to rise, pushing into new waters and leaving trails of ecological health in its wake. Kelp forests stretched across hundreds of kilometers of coastline. Wildlife flourished. Carbon was being captured. Jobs were being created. A once fragile ecosystem had become a source of resilience. And yet, with this success, a new question began to form, what happens next? With the ecosystem restored and the otters firmly reestablished, scientists and policymakers began shifting their focus from recovery to protection. The work was not finished. In fact, it had only just begun. Maintaining what had been achieved would require a long-term strategy, one that accounted for modern threats, respected the needs of coastal communities, and prepared for an uncertain future. One of the biggest challenges was the risk posed by marine pollution and oil spills. Sea otters, for all their strengths, are especially vulnerable to contaminants in the water. Oil clings to their dense fur, stripping it of its insulating properties and exposing the animals to deadly cold. The 1989 Exxon Valdez disaster, which killed thousands of otters in Alaska, remained a cautionary tale. Canada would need to enforce stricter shipping regulations, better emergency response protocols, and tighter oversight of industrial operations near sensitive marine zones. Another challenge was social. While many indigenous communities supported conservation, others raised valid concerns about sovereignty, access to traditional food sources, and the need for better consultation. In response, new co-management models began to emerge partnerships, where First Nations and federal agencies shared authority and responsibility for marine stewardship. These models integrated scientific research with traditional ecological knowledge, helping ensure that restoration efforts served both ecosystems and the people who live within them. At the same time, climate change added a new layer of uncertainty. Rising ocean temperatures, changing currents, and increased acidity could all threaten the delicate balance that had been restored. Would the kelp continue to thrive in warmer waters? Would sea otters shift their range as the climate changed? Scientists were racing to find answers, while also exploring how kelp forests could be used on a larger scale as natural carbon sinks. What had started as a small, local recovery was now influencing global environmental thinking. The lessons from British Columbia about patience, persistence, and letting nature lead were being studied around the world. The sea otters had shown us that ecosystems can recover, that balance can be restored, and that even in the face of Overwhelming damage, healing is possible. One predator, one habitat, one decision at a time. The question now is whether we're willing to protect what we've rebuilt. Whether we will keep listening to the rhythms of nature or drown them out once again. Because if we've learned anything from the sea otters, it's this, sometimes. The smallest creatures carry the weight of the biggest recoveries.